Good morning. We welcome everyone to worship this morning here in the sanctuary and on YouTube. Crew is underway. Our young people meet Sundays at 9 a.m. for fun and learning. They're currently learning about Lent, and after Easter, pre-K through first grade will be learning all about Jesus A to Z, and second and third grade will be the theme Route 66, and they're going to learn about all 66 books of the Bible. So make sure you bring your children, grandchildren, friends. Um, it's a really good time, and the kids uh, are able to really understand the gospel better. The Board of Christian Education needs volunteers for Sunday school. If you'd like to help out, please contact the church office. Um, if we can get a good group of people, we can do a rotation, and then no one will feel like it's an obligation. You'll enjoy what you're doing a little bit more. So let us know if you'd like to help out. Zion is looking for a church custodian. I believe it's only three hours a week. No, it's, 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 it, the hours will vary. Okay, the hours will vary. Um, but it's a pretty minimal commitment, but if it's something you'd like to pick up on the side or you find it in your heart to um, serve the church in that manner, um, it'd be really helpful to uh, get somebody on board with that. And if you have any questions, um, you can contact pa Pastor Alex for um, any questions or for details, um, or you can always speak with uh, Larry and Cheryl, who have been doing it for years. Thank you very much for your service. There is going to be coffee fellowship after worship today for the first time in a really, really long time. So I hope I see your smiling faces there. Um, are there any other announcements? Alex? No. Then I will please, yes. Right. Jim is actually ill. Um, we have a few people out sick. I'm sure Alex will be mentioning that when we do our prayers for the people. But um, we don't have an organist um, here with us today. So we do have some recordings. So songs may change up a little bit. We might have a little bit of pause, but we'll roll with it like we always do, right? All right. Please join us for our call to worship. Please join me in the opening sentences. Come, friends, and sit with him who cares for family and strangers alike. We gather with the one whose lavish love has been poured out for all. Let us bring him our best and pour out our lives as a gift to him. May our hearts be open to the beauty of Christ's presence as we worship in spirit and in truth. Please rise if you're able. Can you increase the volume?
Please join me in the opening prayer. God of love, you have loved us first and continue to love us lavishly. We come this morning longing to love you in return. We hunger for your healing love in our lives and we long to love ourselves and our neighbors. Fill our longing hearts as we join together to worship you. May we pour out our very lives as an offering of praise and love for you in this world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. May be seated.
hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Our scripture reading today. Nope. Is from hang on, hang on a minute. Oh. Oh, young people's moments. I'm going to invite our young people to come forward first. See, the music didn't mess us up. I did. I see some more kids coming. We'll just wait for them. While they're coming, how are you guys doing? How was your week? Good. Well, hello. All right. We just doubled in size just like that, huh? Everybody have a good week? Good week in school? Learn lots of new stuff? Yeah? Good. Well, have you ever heard the word Messiah? You ever hear that word? Have you heard that word? No. Well, the word Messiah... I suppose if you haven't heard it, you probably don't know what it means then. The word Messiah means anointed. You know what anointed means? Anointed is if you anoint somebody, you put a a special oil, which is kind of like a lotion. You put put it on them and bless, bless them with it. Ask God to bless them. Well, sometimes you put it on their heads and sometimes on their... uh, in the, in the days when Jesus was alive, they would sometimes put it on uh, people's shoulders and sometimes even on their feet. So in Jesus' time, they would anoint the person who was going to be the next king. Those are one of the people that they anointed. And what happened was, in today's story, not the one we're going to talk about in church, but in the gospel story from today, th- there, that's what happened. Jesus was anointed. Usually, people who were going to be a king or queen got anointed by somebody who was very important and was the king now or, or was the queen now, and he, he or she would anoint them. Well, that didn't happen that way with Jesus. With Jesus, it was Mary that did that. And what had happened was that Mary wanted to come to him and tell him, thank you for what he had done. You know what he did? Did you ever hear the story of Lazarus when Lazarus died and Jesus came and raised Lazarus from the dead again? Well, Lazarus was Mary's brother. So she wanted to thank him for doing that. And she, was, she didn't know it, but she was also anointing him the king because he is the king, right? Jesus is the king? Yeah. Yeah. And so he was thankful for the gift that he brought her. You know what she brought him? You know what she brought him? She anointed him with very, very expensive perfume. And this perfume cost a lot of money. And she anointed his feet with that very expensive perfume. And she did that because she appreciated Jesus and because she loved him. And Jesus was thankful and said that it was good for her to do that, and that she should bring her gifts to Jesus. And you know what? That's true for us today, too. That's what we learned from today's gospel story, that we can bring our gifts to Jesus. You know, what we can, you know how we can do that? By praying, by reading our Bible, by hearing Bible stories, and learning all about Jesus. And then what do we do with those things that we learn about Jesus? Do we keep them to ourselves? Or do we tell other people about them? Tell other people about them, right? 
share them with other people. So the gifts that we bring to God, God gives back to us, just like Jesus did. He blessed Mary after she had brought him her most expensive thing that she owned and given it to him. So it's important that we give our gifts to God, and then God gives right back to us, gives us more things, all the things that we need and some of the things that we don't need, but we just want. Good, that's because this is all good, right? All right, I want to have you pray with me. Say, dear God, thank you for Jesus. Help us do like he did so we can receive your gifts and share them with other people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go over to the treat table and help yourselves, kiddos. Thank you for your good behavior and paying attention. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Shelley. May God add his his blessing to the reading this morning, and may the words from my mouth be what we need to hear this morning. Years ago, the Florida State University football team recruited a place kicker. His name was Scott Brantley. He was considered to be the best prospect among place kickers in the country at that time. And one of the Florida State coaches asked him this question. What would you do if in the biggest game of the year, on the opening kickoff of a game against our arch rival, Miami, the only player that the coach sent out onto the field was you? Everyone else would sit on the sidelines and you'd go out there by yourself. And he thought about it for a minute and he said, well, if I couldn't kick it out of the end zone, then I'd just have to make the tackle. That's determination. Paul had that kind of determination. Listen to his words. Whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And then he goes on down the line and talks about not having obtained his goal yet. He says that he, forgetting what lies ahead and straining forward, or forgetting what lies behind, I should say, and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. That is determination. 
I press on toward the goal. Could anyone stop Paul from what he was doing? Could anyone stop Paul from serving Christ except by killing him? Imprisonment didn't stop him. Beating him didn't stop him. Ridiculing him didn't stop him. Only death would finally shut him up. I press toward the mark. I struggle for the goal line. If I'm the only player on the field, I'll kick it to the end zone or I'll make the tackle myself. A person with that kind of determination will succeed at whatever it is that she or he is doing or attempts to do. There are three keys to this fierce determination focus, and that is focus, forgetting, and faith. First of all, focus on what really matters. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. Only one thing mattered to Paul, to live for Jesus Christ. That was his focus. You have to have focus if you're going to be successful in anything. In the book, you don't need to have a title to be a leader. The author talks about a friend of his named Bill who lives outside of Kalamazoo, Michigan. He says that several years ago, Bill bought a new house on the edge of a wooded area. And Bill likes to feed birds. So he put a bird feeder up in his backyard. But before the sun set that evening, the squirrels were swinging off the bird feeder and eating all the food. And before he knew it, all the bird seed was gone and the squirrels had eaten it all. He thought, well, I got to do something about this. I want to feed my birds. So for the next two weeks, he declared war on those squirrels. He isn't a mean guy and he wouldn't do anything to hurt them. But he was willing to use any peaceful means necessary to keep the squirrels out of his bird feeder. And so he tried greasing the post of the bird feeder, but that didn't work. He went to the hardware store and he bought a quote-unquote squirrel-proof bird feeder with wire mesh wrapped around it, and the label said that it was guaranteed. So he took it home and he put it in his backyard, and by sunset, the squirrels were swinging off that one too. And they were reaching in and pulling out food and eating the bird seed again. The next day, he took the feeder back to the hardware store, and he said, I want my money back. This doesn't work. The store manager said, well, I could have told you when you bought it that there's no such thing as a squirrel-proof bird feeder. Bill looked at him in disbelief, and he said, you mean we have all this technology, all the things we can do these days, but our best and brightest scientists and engineers can't design a bird feeder that can outsmart an animal? with a brain the size of a pea? And he says, yep, that's right. He says, well, why not? The hardware store manager looks at him and says, let me ask you something, sir. How much time, on average, have you spent in the last two weeks trying to keep the squirrels out of that bird feeder? He said, no, maybe a half hour a day. He said, how much time do you think the squirrel spends each day trying to get in? The answer is, almost every squirrel, if you watch them, spends about 98% of their waking hours looking for food. That's what they do. The moral of the story is this. Focus and determination beats brains and intellect every time. To be successful, you need, first of all, to be focused on what's important. I read a story about a 10-year-old whose name was Taylor, who survived four days all by himself in the swamps, in the waters of Turtle Swamp, Florida. And during these four days, this little guy was floating uh, without food or shelter until he was rescued by a fisherman 14 miles from where he had disappeared from. And this swamp is very, very dangerous. It's so dangerous that four recruits had disappeared and died the previous year uh, when the military was doing some training in that area. But they think that what probably saved Taylor that those, during those days was that he is autistic. And you see, Taylor was fixated completely on one detail in his situation. 
he managed to block out the fear and the hunger so he didn't panic. None of the dangers were distractions to him, like the wild animals, the mosquitoes, the darkness, the loneliness, the scary sounds. None of that was as noticeable to him because his focus was on one thing, as is typical of an autistic child. And this could cause him to do anything, something that would make his situation worse. But he had that tunnel vision, so to speak, focus. Ask any athlete if it's important. Ask any successful business person if focus is important. It's also important to the follower of Christ. Some of us have never settled in our own mind that serving God is the most important single thing in our lives. Paul had that settled. He wrote, I regard everything as loss because of my surpa the surpassing value of knowing Christ my Lord. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Stay focused on what matters most. Next, forget what needs to be forgotten. He said, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal. Don't let the past slow you down. Sometimes we aren't successful in the present because we're still living in the past. In a workshop, a nationally known writer and a consultant by the name of Lyle Shaler asked the group this question. He said, what do you think is the single most powerful influence in your decision-making process when you have a decision to make? For example, if you are in a group trying to make a decision about something or trying to plan an event or a course of action, what is the most powerful influence in the room? And after the group discussed it for a little while, Mr. Shaler gave them his answer. He said, there's no question in my mind the most powerful influence in decision-making is the past. Maybe he's right. Churches are haunted by their past. We've tried that before. It didn't work. Or, but we've never done it that way before. Paul had a past. Paul had been a loyal Jew. He had been a Pharisee. He was very loyal to his faith. He was so loyal to his faith that he persecuted those who followed Christ. He was there and he gave his okay when Stephen was stoned. Then Paul met Christ on the road to Damascus and he became a follower of Jesus. Not too surprisingly, the church rejected him at first because he had been a Pharisee and did persecute the church. They were afraid that this was a trick that he might be playing. After he was accepted by the church, finally, he was persecuted by other Jews and by the Romans for his new faith. There was a lot that Paul had to get past. There were many emotions, guilt, anger, fear, associated with his past that he needed to let go of. Forgetting what is behind, he said. There's something called the second chance theory. According to this theory, one of the most important differences between the children of the so-called lower class and the children of middle and upper class is that more fortunate children are almost always given a second chance. If a kid from the inner city is arrested for shoplifting, or for drunk driving, or for smoking a joint, it's just about impossible for him or her to bounce back. But if a kid with money or influence goes astray, an army of lawyers and psychologists will rush to his or her aid. Nonprofit groups are beginning to take on the challenge of giving deserving kids of all economic groups a second chance. We worship a God who always gives second chances. Paul says, forgetting what is behind and straining for what is ahead, I press on toward the goal, focused on the things that matter the most, forgetting about those things in life that hold us back. Focus, forget. And finally, exercise your faith. I press on toward the goal of the heavenly call Believe the gospel. Believe that life has meaning. Believe that life has purpose. 
Believe that your life is not in vain. Believe that through Christ, you can do all things. You and I want to believe those same things. We want to believe in a loving God who watches over us and provides for every need. But sometimes, life is hard. And sometimes, it's very hard. Professor Charles A. Beard, who was a famous historian, was asked what major lessons he had learned from history. And he answered that he had learned four lessons. And here they are. First, whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad with power. Second, the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceeding small. Third, the bee fertilizes the flower that it robs. And finally, the one I like the best, when it is dark enough, you can see the stars. When it is dark enough, you can see the stars. There may be a darkness over your life right now. You may be facing problems in your family, with your health, with the health of your loved ones, with finances, whatever it may be. Paul knew what it was to go through trying times. Listen as he writes about it. He said, they say they serve Christ, but I have served Christ. I have worked harder, been put in jail oftener, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again and again. Five different times the Jews gave me their terrible 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I was in the open sea all night and the whole next day. I have traveled many weary miles and have been often in great danger from flooded rivers, from robbers, from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the hands of the Gentiles. I have faced grave dangers from mobs in the cities and from death in the deserts and in stormy seas and from men who claim to be brothers but are not. I have lived with weariness and pain and sleepless nights. Often I have been hungry and thirsty and have gone without food. Often I have shivered with cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. That is all from the his letter to the Corinthians, his second letter. Paul knew about extreme difficulty. Most people would have turned back if they would have faced, were to face what he faced. But he kept pressing forward. How did he do it? He focused. He forgot. And he exercised faith. He knew that Christ was with him. And so he was able to hang on, even through those very difficult times. When I was a teenager... I had a neighbor who was a double amputee. He'd lost one leg in the Vietnam War, came home, got into a terrible auto accident, and lost the other leg in that. His name was Mark. I remember him well. He was a good friend. He lived right next door to us. Mark had just been released from the hospital after the accident and was in a wheelchair, of course. And he wanted to decided that he was determined to strengthen his upper body. And he said to his brother and to me, take me for a ride over to Oglesby. I have this spot in mind where I want to exercise. And so we went to Oglesby, and we went to the bottom of this very steep hill on the east end of town, down past the cookie factory, in the, down, down there. So I don't know exactly where it was, but I could show it to you if I had to. And the hill, we, he said, drive down to the bottom of the hill and park the car. So we did. And we got him into his wheelchair. And he said, okay, I'm going to go up that hill. And I looked at that hill and I thought, man, I don't know if I can walk up that hill. And he's going to push a wheelchair up there with his arms, right? And so he tried a few times. He once fell out of his chair. He, could, he couldn't get any more than just a few feet and would roll back down the hill, and we'd have to catch him again. But he was determined. And we got back in the car. He hadn't made it up the hill, of course. He said, what are you going to do now, Mark? And he said, well, I want you to bring me back tonight, after it gets dark. I said, okay. So we brought him back that evening, after it got dark. He said, okay. I'll put a flashlight in my lap. 
We did. Turned the flashlight on. And it was very, very dark. He began to go up the hill a little bit at a time. And he got about halfway up the hill that night. Turned around and went back down. And of course, after we went there a few more nights, he was able to make it. Well, several more nights. He was able to make it to the top of that hill. I never could figure it out. I couldn't figure out why at night he could get up that hill. But during the day, he could not. And years later, it dawned on me that in the daytime, he would look at that hill, and it was overwhelming. It was huge. It was long. It was steep. And it was just too much to imagine making it up there. But at night, with his little flashlight, he could just see a few feet in front of him, and he could make that few feet. And then he'd see a few more feet in front of him, and he'd make that few feet. And I learned a very, I learned a very valuable lesson from Mark. And that is, even if that hill is really, really big and really steep, and it doesn't look like you're going to be able to climb it, take it just a few feet at a time. Don't try to beat the hill in one day. But he was determined. He was going to climb that hill. And he did. And that's what Paul did. And that's what we can do. A few feet at a time. Like the football player. We've all seen the great play at one time or another. Players hanging on him and he just keeps on running. Nothing stops him. He keeps going because he's determined to reach that goal. Paul couldn't be stopped because of his faith. He said, I live, but not I, but Christ that lives in me, in Galatians. Pressing toward the mark, struggling toward the goal line. You'll have to kill me to stop me. Not giving up in the face of obstacles, even great obstacles. Let's ask God to give us that kind of fierce determination. We've faced some very difficult days lately. This past week has been a, an overwhelming week in my life. It's been very difficult. And I've had to heed this advice. One day at a time, no. One hour at a time, no. I had my days this week where it was one minute at a time, just to get through the day. Let's ask God to give us that kind of determination to make it through as we move forward in the days ahead. Amen. Now as we prepare for communion shortly, let's stand, as, if you're able, as we sing together as we gather at your table.
seated. We're going to go to prayer shortly. I, I did want to mention we, had a, we have a couple of birthdays this week. On Wednesday, Shirley Lopeman. Hi, Shirley, who is in our Zion West uh, group. We'll have a birthday on Wednesday. And also, Kenny Lindenmeyer will have a birthday. Kenny's, I'm assuming, going to be a year old. Hard to believe. It's hard to believe if we reach that already. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Shirley and Kenny. Happy birthday to you. All right. I'm going to ask for prayer requests in a moment, but before I do, I want to mention a few this morning. It's been a time when, with a lot of illness and uh, some serious illness. Uh, Jack Hamilton was taken to the hospital by ambulance on Thursday and was transferred to OSF in Peoria on Friday morning. Uh, Jack has pneumonia. Uh, it got pretty serious, but he is improving. Um, Shelly and I went down and visited with him yesterday, and uh, he's, he's doing better. He has a ways to go, but uh, he also has some other health issues, as most of you know, that uh, they're, going to, they're, they're working on those things as well while he's there. Uh, they've taken some blood marrow, a blood marrow sample, and... By Tuesday, they ought to have some, hopefully have some results for him. Uh, he's still losing blood, and uh, they had to give him two or three units while he was there uh, when, he, when he first arrived in Peoria. So uh, let's keep Jack in our prayers. Um, he, it, Craig has been with him pretty much the whole time, his son, and uh, says to me that he, he thinks he's improved quite a bit in just a day or two's time. So we'll continue to pray for Jack. Also, um, as Shelley said earlier, things are a little different here this morning because Jim isn't here. Jim Greening is sick, has been sick for the last, uh, four, I think, four days now. Uh, I think it's the flu. When I spoke to him this morning, he said that he felt uh, a little bit better today. So keep Jim in your prayers in the days to come. Also, we have uh, Marion was, Marion Benedict was in the hospital. She was released uh, yesterday afternoon and is back home now. Uh, some of the fluids uh, that she's been retaining have been uh, resolved with Lasix, and she still, has, she still has some fluid that she needs to uh, get rid of, but they felt that she was at a safe level to go home, so she's home now. They also made some changes in her medication. So keep Marion in your prayers. Also, uh, I'm not sure how things have turned out, so I'm just going to ask you to pray for the Johnson family, uh, for Marty Johnson and his family at this time. Um, I think that's... My, my niece, Cheyenne, uh, isn't doing any better. Uh, she's joined us now, so there's problems with the liver and... Uh, it's not getting any better so far, so let's keep Cheyenne on your prayers, if you would, please. Um, am I forgetting anybody? Rusty Thies. Rusty Thies, thank you. We also visited with Rusty yesterday. Rusty is in very good spirits. He was uh, joking and laughing, and uh, we had good conversation with him. He wanted me to express his gratitude to the Zion family for the cards and notes that he's received and for all the support. And uh, he was very sincere. He, uh, I think he might have shed a tear when he was telling me that. So uh, please continue to pray for Rusty. He has uh, several different very serious things going on and is in the cardiac unit at, at OSF. Any, anybody else have requests? Shelley?
Oh, baby Roman's come to see us. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> there he is. Look up. Look back and look up. She's got him by the... There he is. Hi, Roman. <laughs> we we're so glad you brought him today to now. <laughs> yeah, I... I there, there are a lot of people who, are, who just uh, have, either have the flu, have a bad cold, sore throat, all that kind of stuff going on right now. Mary called me this morning, Mary Thies, and said that she wouldn't make it this morning because she has a sore throat. and you know, just seems to be a lot, lot going around. Ernie? David Baster's mother-in-law passed away. Okay. Anybody else? Continue to pray for Shelley's mom, Carol. Teresa. You have a birthday this Friday, Nancy? And you. Happy birthday. To you. Happy birthday, dear Nancy. Happy birthday to you. Are you not on the list or did I just miss you? You aren't on the list. You will be now. <laughs> That's Friday? <laughs> she thought she was going to sneak one past us, didn't she? Okay, anybody else? I don't see anything in the chat box. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a situation I was referring to. I didn't know how it, you know, if it, that had happened yesterday or. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how, we don't know how it turned out exactly, but Marty's only brother, right? Mike, who's, who's a friend of mine. I've known him since I was a kid. Uh, is uh, down at OSF and on life support had several strokes, uh, some smaller ones, and then a major stroke. Uh, they've determined that there's really not much hope, and so the family uh, was waiting for his oldest boy, Mike Jr., who is a Marine, stationed in Japan to get back to the States. Uh, and they're going, they were going to make a decision, I think, yesterday. Um, and I, I think, the decision is probably going to be to uh, to uh, end his life. So, uh, be in prayer for Marty, for the whole family. Um, Marty and Lori have been through a, a real lot this year, uh, especially the past. It seems like the past six months or so, it's been really tough for them. So, let's keep them in our prayers as well. Okay, let's go to prayer. Center us now, God, on your presence in this place with your people as we lift up our desires, our needs, our fears, our failures. We've sometimes failed to be obedient to your will in our lives as individual people and sometimes without realizing it as a church. We pray that you will forgive us and enable us to do and to be what you want us to be and to share the gospel. Open us to your Holy Spirit and awaken us to live faithfully as your people in a changing, often hurting world. We pray for those around us who need your care. We ask that you would Use us as your instruments of healing and peace. We pray especially for those that we've named this morning 
and others that we lift to you in the silence of our hearts. We ask you to reveal your presence to them and to us, God, that as people of faith, we may be empowered to serve you and to serve others and to bring glory to you. For we offer our prayers and our lives in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever, as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I don't think we have music for this one. Let's sing this one a cappella. Me a servant, humble and weak, Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. May the prayer of my heart always be. Those of you who are watching us by way of YouTube this morning, uh, you may or may not have noticed in the chat box, but Jerry did enter a little note for you there. We went off for a little bit, but we're back, and uh, he will be uploading the entire service this afternoon so that it will be there in its entirety. I'm going to ask Larry to bring the offering forward at this time, and as he does, I have a little story for you. There were once two brothers named William and Wayne. Will was 12 years old and his little brother was three. The neighbors noticed that they always went everywhere together. If William went down to the park, his little brother would toddle along behind him. Even if the playing was a little rough, he played. And when Wayne went to play group, his older brother would come and he would sit there with the toddlers and play with them. One neighbor thought that this was very unusual. So one day he leaned over the fence and he asked their mother why they were so inseparable, even though with that much difference in age, you'd think they wouldn't have much in common. And the mother replied, well, don't you know where there's a will, there's a Wayne? I don't write them, I just read them. (laughs) Remember, God loves a cheerful giver. Thank you once again for your continued support of the work here, and God bless you for it. Now let us dedicate this offering to God. We bring our gifts to you and offer them as a symbol of sacrifice and service. We seek to share a story that fulfills and conquers death. Bless these gifts and all who give. Use our wealth, our time, our abilities for the good of all your people, O Lord. Amen. In the Gospel of Luke, we read of our Savior, who at the table with two of his disciples took bread and broke it and blessed it and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened, the scriptures tell us, and they recognized the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. In company with all believers in every time and beyond time, we come now to this table to know the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. We want to make it clear that no matter who you are, no matter what you believe, you are welcome to join us at this table. Let us give thanks. Holy God, you have created us, You are as close to us as breathing and you are as distant as the farthest star. 
We thank you for your constant love for us and for all that you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life, for all people of faith in every generation who have given themselves to your will, and especially we thank you for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, for his life, for his death, and his resurrection, and for the calling forth of your church and its mission in the world. Gifted by the presence of your Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you as we unite our voices with faithful people in every time and place we say, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Merciful God, as sisters and brothers in Christ, we recall anew those words and those acts of Jesus. As they were eating, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, eat, it is my body. Jesus took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We remember Christ's promise not to drink of the fruit of the vine again until the heavenly banquet at the close of history. And we say boldly what we believe. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, bless this bread, this fruit of the vine, these elements in each home who are participating. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at this table, that our eyes may be opened and we may recognize the risen Christ in our world, in each other, and in all for whom Christ died. Amen. Through the broken bread, we participate in the body of Christ. Shall we partake? And as you do, remember, Christ died for you. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life that Christ gave us. As we partake of the cup, remember that he rose again that you might have new and eternal life. Now join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. Gracious God, we thank you that in this sacrament you assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Help us to grow in love and obedience that we may serve you in the world and finally be brought to that table where all your saints feast with you forever. Amen. Now stand if you are able.
And now go forth for God. Go in peace. And may God's peace go with you. Bring hope and healing to all who you meet. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a good week. downstairs for some coffee or a drink and cookies.